Greed is the disordered desire for more than is decent or deserved, not for the greater good, but for one's own selfish interest, and is usually at the detriment of others or society at large. Greed can be for anything, but is most commonly for food, possessions, power, fame, status, attention, admiration, sex, or money. money. Greed is, to say the least, a mixed blessing. There is many theories out there that greed is programmed into our DNA as a way to promote survival or reproduction, to ensure that we become stronger than any situations or people who may threaten us, or even to ensure that we never lack the resources that we may need in the future. However, people who are consumed by greed may become toxically fixated on the object of their desire. Their lives may be reduced to little more than a quest to accumulate as much as possible, or to obtain copious amounts of whatever it is that they covet or crave. Even though they have achieved every reasonable need or more, they are totally unable to redirect their desires to obtain other or more important things. After a prolonged time, greed has a tendency to become rather embarrassing. And once this stage has arrived, it is common for a person to become deceitful to hide this embarrassing characteristic. For example, a person who may choose to run for political office because they crave power may tend to tell others, and also likely themselves, that what they really want is to help other people or to serve for their country. That being said, it appears as though deception is a common outcome of greed. Greed can also be associated with many negative psychological states, such as stress, exhaustion, anxiety, depression, and despair, and can result in behaviors such as gambling, scavenging, hoarding, trickery, and theft. When a person becomes consumed by greed, they tend to override reason, and by overriding reason, many natural emotions like compassion and love tend to become devalued. Greed can loosen family relationships and community ties, and will often undermine the bonds and values upon which our society is built. We interrupt this programming to bring you a greed-ridden sociopath. This is Carl Carlson. Carl grew up alongside five brothers and one sister in Seneca, New York. He raised Belgian draft horses since childhood and would frequently visit the family farm to continue to do so. Carl would commonly brag about raising the tallest mare in the world at one time. During Carl's early 20s, he joined the U.S. Air Force and became a part of a team that transported nuclear missiles. After leaving the U.S. Air Force in the early 1980s, Carl met a woman by the name of Christina, and Christina and Carl quickly fell in love. They moved in together and tied the knot. And in 1984, Carl and Christina moved into a former gold miner's shack in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains approximately 2,600 kilometers away from Seneca, New York. They moved here due to a trades job opportunity provided to Carl by Christina's father. Shortly after the move, Carl went on to purchase a brand new Mustang, and not long after purchasing this Mustang, the vehicle mysteriously caught fire in the couple's driveway. Luckily for Carl, there was not many items left inside the vehicle, and he also had a fairly high-paying insurance policy. Carl received the money from the insurance company and happily continued his life in the mountains with Christina. Carl and Christina also went on to have three children, Aaron, Katie, and Levi. The family appeared to be relatively happy as they would celebrate holidays with extended family and there was no mention of abuse or mistreatment. However, it was stated that Carl and Christina began to argue more nearing the end of the 80s. New Year's Day, 1991. Katie, Aaron, and Levi lay asleep in their beds while Carl was attempting to fix a fan that was stored in the attic. He turned on the light in the attic, retrieved the fan, and brought it outside to the garage. Christina decided to take a bath, so Christina headed towards the bathroom, which had a boarded-up window. Apparently, she noticed a jug on the floor by the kitchen that she believed was water and placed it by the bathroom door before entering the bath. Just moments later, while Carl was repairing the fan in the garage, Carl stated that he heard a desperate screaming coming from the house. He then ran out and noticed that the house was on fire, and he made the quick decision to break Levi's window and drag him outside. He then ran to the other bedroom window and broke it as well to save his two daughters from the blaze before attempting to save Christina. Carl then ran towards the bathroom and found that the jug that was placed in front of the bathroom door was actually a jug containing kerosene. And so the bathroom hallway was completely engulfed in flames, preventing Carl from being able to rescue Christina. Christina did not make it out of the house and the local authorities arrived on the scene. When Carl was questioned about what he believed started the fire, he stated that the light that he turned on in the attic had a history of malfunctioning and that they commonly stored the kerosene jug in the attic, which they used to power kerosene heaters. So, he believes that maybe the rug in the attic was also soaked in kerosene, and that the broken light may have ignited it. Firefighters examined the house and believed that Carl's story added up explaining that the fire definitely started by the light in the attic. They then ruled the fire as accidental. One officer did state that he believed this story was a little bit fishy, as he noted that the light that Carl claimed likely started the fire was found completely turned off. 
Coincidentally, Carl had taken out a life insurance policy on Christina just three weeks earlier. And despite one investigator providing his doubt about how the fire took place, the insurance company deemed the fire as an accident and not long after Christina's death, Carl collected about $200,000 from this policy. Just four days later, before being able to attend Christina's funeral, Carl moved him, his children, and the family dog back to Seneca, New York and began a new life there, just under two years after Christina's death in November of 1992. Carl went on to meet a woman by the name of Cindy Best at a line dancing club. Just under a year after meeting, Carl and Cindy would go on to get married in 1993. For the next nine or so years, things for Carl Carlson and his family appeared to be relatively normal, until 2002 when another fire took place, killing multiple valuable horses that Carl had raised. Carl received a payment from the insurance company for the deaths of these horses. Things went quiet again for another six years, and although some of the family would state that Carl would visit much less and seemed much more subdued than prior to the fire, overall, things seemed as though they were going okay for the Carlsons. Carl's son Levi would eventually move out of the family home at 16 years old, and just two years later would have two daughters of his own. Despite having a slightly rocky relationship, he would still stay relatively close with his father and visit quite often. Carl's brother would state that during the years following the death of Christina, the relationship between Carl, Katie, and Aaron visibly changed over time. It wasn't until November 20th of 2008 that Cindy Carlson would discover a horrific crime scene and in a panic dial 911. 911, what's the location of your emergency? I think I need an ambulance. Okay, what's going on? The truck fell on my stepson. Are you with your son right now? <laughs> He's not alive. Is he, is he breathing? No. He is not breathing. Okay. No. Oh my God. I don't know how long he's been in there. <laughs> We've been gone since noon. Okay, we're going to start CPR, okay? Carl, they want to start CPR. Do you know what CPR is? Chest is crushed. His chest is crushed. His chest is crushed? No. He, he's probably been under here for hours. Okay. Oh my God. Twenty-three-year-old Levi Carlson had been visiting his parents' property to use their garage to do some repairs on his pickup truck. While Levi was working underneath the truck, Carl and Cindy were inside the house getting ready to go to a funeral. The two headed out to their vehicle, and Cindy enters the passenger side. Carl then walks up to the door and tells Cindy he needed to check up on Levi in the garage before leaving. Carl then walked over to the garage, spent a couple minutes inside, and then returned to the vehicle. Carl and Cindy then left the house, and everything appeared to be completely fine. Approximately four hours later, the two returned home. They looked towards the garage and noticed that Levi's truck was still there. Concerned, both Carl and Cindy quickly enter the garage and find Levi completely pinned underneath the truck. Levi's truck was being held up by a single car jack, and it looked as though the jack had somehow fallen over while Levi was working, resulting in the injuries that caused his death. The circumstances surrounding Levi's death are actually quite common, as jack safety is extremely important when working underneath a vehicle. Using a single jack, which is set to a high height, can and has resulted in this type of situation in the past. It is recommended to have a fail-safe like a spare tire underneath the wheel when performing work underneath the vehicle. And so, an investigation took place, and the investigators quickly deemed Levi's death as an accident. It appeared as though Carl had no involvement, and the police had no interest in further investigating the death. A few days later, Carl was speaking with his wife Cindy, and mentioned that just two and a half weeks earlier, he had driven Levi to an insurance company to make sure that they had set up a life insurance policy to protect Levi's daughter in case anything were to happen to him. He reminded Levi about the importance of Christina's life insurance policy, and Levi was easily persuaded when Carl offered to pay for the first premium on the policy. The money from Levi's policy was meant to cover the cost of glasses, medical bills, food, and college for both of the daughters, if needed. Levi had even written up a will stating all of this. So, as it turns out, Carl was set to receive $707,000 for the death of his son Levi. Cindy immediately became suspicious of this, but kept completely quiet for the following three years. After witnessing Carl spend the insurance money generously on himself, starting a new company, buying himself cars, and going on vacations, Cindy became increasingly suspicious of Carl. She once asked Carl to explain what happened with his first wife, and Carl apparently had an answer for every question she asked, making the story feel totally believable. However, 
Cindy still had her suspicions, and after a rocky couple years, Cindy began to reevaluate the man that she had been married to for the last 17 years. She also began to reevaluate the $1.2 million life insurance policy that was in her name. After growing increasingly paranoid, Cindy decided to leave Carl and quickly go to the police in 2012. The police became aware of the pattern of events and came up with a plan in attempt to obtain a confession. They decided to ask Cindy to set up a meeting between the two. So Cindy reached out to Carl and asked if they could talk about getting back together. They then placed a wire on Cindy. The investigators instructed Cindy to bribe Carl with the opportunity of getting back together, as long as he tells her the truth. So that's exactly what she did. yes or no to what I ask you, then I would know that you, you want to But I can't get back with you without you telling me the Although Cindy stated that Carl completely admitted to the murder of Levi, the audio recording was not clear enough to work with. So the two of them arranged another meeting. How am I going to set a trap? Do you want to go through my purse? I asked you if you pushed the truck and you said yes. I, I didn't push the truck, I said. No, I said I had nothing to do, but I said I took advantage of the situation once it happened. And that is exactly what I said to you. Carl, you told me that you didn't set it up that way, but when you were in there, you saw the opportunity. No, after it had happened. So right now I need to I know, but I'm just share. telling you. I mean, did it fall hard or? No. I mean, you just, it just I had to bump it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because it it's so wobbly, you know, because the only thing that was touching the ground is just the back two wheels in it. So then what happened? It, and then, I mean, what did he make a noise? It was instant. I thought, I mean, you think. All right. Um. I'll be in touch with you. Okay? All right, bye. At this point, the police believed that they had seen enough and that Carl Carlson was at very least involved in the passing of Levi in 2008. They then arrested him and took him in for an interrogation. You confessed to your wife. I like my wife. What is that? Are you have a wire? Well, yes, we do. I thought you did. It's all recorded. I can tell you the There's no way. Well, we were saying is, and what we know to be true, what we know to be true is you push that car over. I did not. Well, the only thing that remains to be found out is if, what the reasons were. No, you, know, you, you uh, don't kill your son. You don't kill anybody listen. for money. Carl's story would change several times, initially stating that Levi was fine when he checked up on him and only discovered him dead after arriving home from the funeral with Cindy, then stating that he found Levi dead, yet still went to the funeral with Cindy. Let's talk about what you I walked in there and... I walked in there to, you know, give him his money, and holy f And I just, why? Why did you keep it a secret for so long? It was before you left. You died. And it wasn't because of anything other than crushing chest. We can prove right now that it was you that forced that car over. So Levi, just... Total coincidence, takes out a $700,000 license policy and they for his father that he doesn't get a lot of it. It's a sole beneficiary. And you have to pay the policy. He comes over to your house with a $700,000 life insurance policy. He is under his truck that your son, that the one you're supposed to love and care for, this is your blood, your flesh and blood. Randomly, the truck falls over on him while you're there and you say, well, you see, you might say that. Maybe we both know you. You let him be crushed under there, you go back and go, Okay, honey, let's go to your uncle's funeral. I'm free. I'm panicked. I'm, I don't know. A million thoughts went through my head. Eventually claiming that he found Levi alive while being crushed by the truck, and instead of helping him, he was in too much of a shock to help before heading to the funeral. I mean, it was an accident. I blame myself every day. I opened the truck door. Okay. And they did it. So I opened up the truck door, stepped in, Laid over the seat to move the linkages and all that, and it went into 
It just fell. This statement was enough for the officers to charge Carl in relation to the murder of Levi Carlson. Carl was facing charges for first-degree murder as well as an additional charge of insurance fraud. So, in 2013, Carl Carlson confessed to the murder of Levi Carlson as part of a deal to have the insurance fraud charges dismissed. He went on to state that Levi was under the truck when he checked up on him, and that the truck was jacked up nearly to the jack's highest point. Carl could feel how unstable the truck was, and so he pushed the vehicle off the jack, instantly crushing Levi. He stated that Levi did not die instantly, yet he still left him to attend the funeral with Cindy. One year later, in 2014, the investigation into the house fire that took Christina's life was reopened, and investigators believed that the circumstances regarding both crimes were similar enough to place charges against Carl for the murder of Christina as well. During the trial, prosecutors discovered that Carl had taken out life insurance policies on both of Levi's daughters, his own grandchildren. Carl continued to deny any involvement in the fire. Carl Carlson was sentenced to 15 years to life for the death of Levi Carlson, to be served in Seneca, New York as well as another life sentence to be served in California following the completion of his first. When a person becomes consumed by greed, they tend to override reason. And by overriding reason, many natural emotions like compassion and love tend to become devalued. Greed can loosen family relationships and community ties, and will often undermine the bonds and values upon which our society is built. A greedy man with a very cold heart. That's how Carl Carlson's former father-in-law describes him. His first wife, his son, and his horses all died years apart, and police say Carlson collected insurance payouts on all of them. He showed no remorse today, and that bothers me. The smirks, the grins, it's, it's like it was a game, and it wasn't a game. It was people's lives.